guys, Ralph here, and welcome to True Power Trumpet Fitness on this wonderful Wednesday here in Connecticut. Life's good, man. Life is good. It's a beautiful day. The uh, leaves are out in buds and everything. The pollen is high. If I'm sneezing and uh, wiping my eyes and all that sort of stuff, bear with me. All right? Happens every year. Anyway, you saw the thumbnail. Derek Watkins, one of the monsters of monsters. I mean, just the goods. Uh, I don't know much more about him than most of you do. Uh, all my friends in the UK, which I have several of them, uh, feel free to comment down, down, uh, down below if you, if you uh, so desire. And I'm going to leave a link down below that I want you to check out. And um, yeah, I can't analyze his jobs. I absolutely can. Anyway, let me honk and we will get to a little bit of Derek Watkins stuff. double C's, a little Moray's Rondo, and please compare and contrast my Moray's Rondo at the end of all these videos, which is, I'm going to, I can't get check, I think it's 20 years ago, uh, and I think as far as Moray Rondo go, my version is quite good, but I don't sell the CD anymore because it is not an accurate depiction of how I'm playing now. I think you will agree if you compare and contrast the notes don't pop nearly as much on the uh, on the earlier version as they do now. All right, and both of my versions, this one and the one at the end, is better than Gerard Schwartz's. I, <laughs> I'm saying that. Anyway, Derek Watkins. Once again, I'm a little hesitant to uh, talk about people. I'm going to sneeze. <coughs> I'm sorry, guys. I'm sorry. It's this time of year. Anyway. Derek Watkins, uh, born in 1945 in England, and brought, brought up, I'm going to sneeze again, <coughs> guys, I'm sorry, I'm not going to do much of a video today unless I sneeze in it, so I'll do my best. Brought up in England, and if you know anything about the English uh, history of um, brass playing, they have a long, rich tradition of amazing brass bands. And he was brought up in that tradition. He started playing when he was four years old. His great-grandfather was a very well-renowned um, uh, conductor of the brass bands. His grandfather as well. And he was joining the bands when he was very, very young. And guys, there are some really, really great parts to be played in those bands. Remember, it's all brass. So if they're doing arrangements of Rossini overtures or something like that, the cornets are playing the violin parts and all this sort of stuff. It's an incredible thing. The closest I got in, in, uh, to that in, um, was in college. I played in a brass choir, but it wasn't the same thing. Would have loved to have done it. But anyway, that's what he was brought up. And at 17 years old, he turned professional. Never went to college, which is not unusual for that time. Not unusual at all. It was a very, very common theme that if you wanted to be a great musician, a great trumpet player, Doc Severson did the same thing. You go to high school and then you go out on the road and you pay your dues and you learn how to play and you get your chops beat up or you, you, you survive or whatever. And you know, the weak, the meek shall inherit the earth or the, the strong live to say another day and the meek go into something else. But that is a very, very common thing back then to 
to do it. And that, that is what he did. Okay? Obviously, he made the right choice because he was everywhere. Everywhere as solo as this, solo as that, and the James Last Orchestra. Guys, there's so much stuff of him on the um, internet. Um, he did all the uh, James Bond movies, most of the James Bond movies, if not all. Uh, I think he started with Dr. No. Doesn't matter. Uh, he soloed with the London Philharmonic. I mean, he was at anything that the London Philharmonic commercial didn't have the lead guy for. It was him. It was him. And uh, just a tremendous, tremendous high note player. I wouldn't even necessarily call him a lead player in the traditional sense because he was a soloist pretty much from the beginning. Now, he did play a lot of jazz. You know, he sat in with Count Basie and, and all that sort of stuff, at, at the jazz clubs in England and whatnot. So he's very well versed and um, just a terrific, terrific trumpet player. Now, it's very, very interesting. If you look at his chops, his chops look picture perfect. There's no, no stretch whatsoever. His top lip looks very, very thick. Now it's relaxed. Okay. His bottom lip, same thing, looks very, very thick. A la Maurice Andre, a la Harry James. He looks, he looks very, very similar to those as far as that is concerned. Now, as I said before, he has his own uh, overall look to it, but he had that, and you look at that, and it's pretty much a given. Now, another thing, the link down below that uh, was sent to me by Dave Perico, if you look at uh, it's a very short one. I don't think it's more than eight minutes. But if you look closely at the three-minute mark, he takes a breath, and sure enough, this big horse tongue is right there to see. I mean, it is right there. It goes quickly, but you can't miss it. Now, for all of you that have been following this, this uh, channel for a number of years, you, I'm preaching to the choir about the thick tongue and forward and all this sort of stuff, but I do get new subscribers every single day. And guys, if you are not on board with that thick tongue forward through the teeth against the soft rib, I get you're wrong. The top, the greatest players have their tongue there. It is not the Claude Gordon IEE stuff. It's just plain not. Okay? A lot of pretty good players do that and get decent results, but for the most part, the monsters that we just we just can't get enough of are playing with the tongue in that position. Okay? Now, as I mentioned very, very briefly a minute ago, I gotta get going, I have a student. Um, his chops are mangled. Absolutely 100% mangled. Now, I just got through saying that his chops look great, and if you listen to him, there's very, very little strain in the sound. Maybe in the extreme upper register, it gets a little squealy at times. But the marks, I can only blame on inferior mouthpieces. Now, to many of you that live in the UK, that may be spitting on the flag because these were his custom made mouthpieces for a long time. He might have gotten the marks years ago and they, he just played every day, so they, they didn't go away. Okay? But that is the only thing that I can see. Now, a lot of you pessimists may say, look, Ralph, <laughs> Louis Armstrong, Wayne Bargeron, Derek Watkins, lots of guys played with mangled lips. You're right. It can be done. It can be done. But why? Why have sore, stiff, abused lips when well, you don't have to? All right? Anyway, Derek Watkins, great player. And also, you're going to hear on that, on that uh, video down, the link down below, tremendous sound on the flugelhorn. Tremendous sound. Dave Perico sent it to me, and I swear to God, I think he sounds much like Perico, in that it's centered, pure, and it still retains some brilliance with the, the roundness of the flugelhorn. To my ear, that's, that flugelhorn sounded beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. Anyway, I got to go. Speaking of the UK, I have a student in the UK in about two and a half minutes, so uh, that's it. Eat and drink your fruits and vegetables and your starches, and live your life with true power. Love you all. Okay.